go. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Kine. I'm Stenton's curator. And we're, I'm joined here um, at the museum by um, my colleague, Rachel Korma, for this Facebook Live tour of the Blue Lodging Room. And we're going to do our best to keep this interactive. And she will be monitoring the sort of chat and questions. So please feel free um, to jump in with thoughts, and we'll do our best in real time to, um, to answer and foster uh, a little bit of discussion. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to go to the Blue Lodging Room, um, and many of you probably know, but I'll just, um, Stenton was, was completed in 1723. We're about five miles outside of the center of Philadelphia, and um, James Logan, who was William Penn's secretary, built the house. He was a Quaker. He was also a, an owner of enslaved Africans, so those things might seem um, a bit in, in conflict, but we'll talk about that um, more on a future tour. But for today, we are going to really focus our time thinking about the third generation who lived in this house. So James Logan's grandson, Dr. George Logan, and his wife, Deborah Norris Logan. I'm just briefly going to orient you a little bit to the architectural features of the house. So I mentioned it's completed in the second quarter of the 18th century. So it's somewhat typical for that time. The best rooms in the house have these Election molded, these very curvy raised panel frames, and we'll see that in the room where we're about to go. And the house um, passages, the ones that are the most publicly um, traversed, and sort of the procession rooms have double wide passages. And so here on the landing, we're on the second floor, we have um, a double wide pair of doors lining up with the staircase. And what looks like a double wide pair of doors to create a sense of symmetry. But in fact, we're going to follow the um, single wide door into the blue lodging room, and on our right is a false panel. And the room is called the blue lodging room because of the colors of the textiles actually from its first couple of generations to live here, the James Logan and William Logan generation, for which we have estate inventories when those owners um, died. Um, but we're gonna focus today, as I mentioned, on George and Deborah. And in fact, here's um, Dr. George Logan, painted by Gilbert Stewart. He um, lived from 1753 to 1821, and his wife, Deborah Norris Logan, whose life dates are 1761 to 1839. She was painted by their friend and at the time neighbor, Charles Wilson Peel. This painting is after his original work. And uh, George was painted by Gilbert Stewart when he was a US Senator in Washington. So he studied um, medicine in Edinburgh, Scotland during the um, American Revolution and came back after, after the war to inherit Stenton, and he married Deborah Norris Logan in 1781. So the way that this room is set out very much reflects probably their general occupation of Stenton. And she really loved old things. She had an antiquarian heart, and um, she tells us in her diary, and I should mention that her diaries are 18 um, manuscript volumes, mostly at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, but also at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Um, where she tells us so much about her life and life at Stenton. She tells us that her um, favorite piece of furniture in the house was her grandmother's old sofa. So you can imagine this um, early-ish 18th century sofa that was somewhere in this house. We don't know quite what that um, precisely would have looked like. Other things she tells us in her diary is that um, her room is the one on the second floor with four windows. And at some point, you'll get a sense that this room actually has four windows, which is somewhat unusual. Most every opportunity in the house for a window has one, where we have one wall here behind the bed that does not. Um, and she also refers to this room as my apartment in the library. And that's because um, James Logan was one of the colony's greatest book collectors and had nearly 3,000 volumes in this house at the time of his death in 1751, largely in this room. And one of the um, original 
bookcases created for his library, survived in the attic and was brought down into this space in the 1950s. It, um, without sort of being in this space, it's actually quite a rickety piece of just pine boards that are notched together, but it's cut out to sit on the chair rail and the baseboard, which actually gives it support. At one point, it was an expandable kind of system, so there's a little molding there that went to a shelf across the door and down to more shelving that would have been on the other side. We also think that it's very likely the built-in closets in the room, like this press cupboard, um, were designed specifically for probably the amount of books that Logan had in 1730 when he moved here. But Deborah, going jumping ahead to the 1780s um, and early 19th century again, tells us that she keeps her manuscripts in the press cupboard in the library. She's um, quite upset that men get to publish their works, whereas her poetry, her writings, um, her transcriptions of old James Logan papers are kept here, um, and that women's voices are not so public and are kept much more silent. Um, but if you come into the closet a little bit, I'm just going to spend a few moments in here looking at a few things. What, we have um, one of Deborah's sort of friends later in life after George, George died in 1821. In 1823, she started receiving regular visits from this Germantown gentleman, John Fanning Watson, um, who was the cashier at the bank and would write um, the Annals of Philadelphia to be published in 1830. Um, but his manuscript versions of that book, if you want to, if you can pop in here a little bit, actually show that Deborah Logan literally helped to write the book. This is, this is her handwriting here. So that comment I made about her being um, dismayed that men got to publish and women did not is because she was not acknowledged by Watson um, in the, the published version of the book. But he and she exchanged many things. He, had, um, he took away some of the furniture that was in the attic at Stenton and in return he would give her sweet little things like one of these snuff boxes and he gave these to a number of people who he knew were kind of interested in um, the founding era and it contains mahogany from Columbus's house supposedly treaty tree elm it's made of walnut that grew outside of Independence Hall um, and she also had another sort of little treaty tree elm box here um, and this is Watson's sketch of this sort of famous tree under which um, William Penn is said to have treated with the Indians in 1682 um, at Kensington, sort of just north of the city proper. And it fell down in a great storm in 1810 and its wood was harvested for many relics of the founding era led by people like Watson. So it's kind of an antiquarian fervor that went on, and you can imagine maybe that Deborah and Watson perhaps even sat, whether in the parlor or in this room, um, at this Pembroke table that would have been made for Deborah about the time that she and George were married in the 1780s. So a, a receipt survives in um, papers of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania detailing many furnishings that were made um, for Deborah, essentially her, her dowry um, in the early 1780s by the joiner, or at least came from his workshop, um, Thomas Tuft. And most of these pieces of furniture are in what we call the Chippendale Marlborough style. So like the bedstead, they have um, straight legs and often with these little block feet. And the block feet are, are in fact missing from the table. But the chairs that we have, these Chippendale style chairs that are on the receipt are on loan to Stenton from the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Um, and there's some question about whether these tapered leg chairs could have been on um, that receipt. And in fact, one of these chairs that we now own is numbered 18, which is more than the 12 open back chairs um, that appeared on the receipt. But the bedstead probably is the one on the receipt. It actually came down through some Norris descendants. And the chest on chest in the room, the sort of Chippendale style with 
blind fretwork and the broken um, pediment is it's very similar to one that Deborah owned. It says on the receipt that she had a pair of drawers and because this is two cases, a chest on a chest, it makes it a pair of drawers with the fret, as I mentioned, and little dentals, these teeth-like ornaments. Um, but this one was actually made for George Logan's brother and his wife, George Logan's brother Charles and Mary Pleasance, who married in 1779 here in Philadelphia, and so it's probably their chest, then taken to Virginia. And there's a label inside, um, which I'm not sure if my handy dandy cameraman can get to or not. We'll see. I can't quite read it, but <laughs> it is, um, it details that, um, it, and it tells us, reminds us that Charles and Mary inherited her family's plantation lands, hundreds of slaves and hundreds of acres in, um, in Virginia and took this chest with them. At some point along the way that the label tells us in, in the family, when they moved this chest, they broke um, the urn and flowers at the top and it was reassembled in 1899 and um, one flower was missing. So that's been changed, its waist molding has changed and its feet were lowered as well. So it probably was being used in a much lower space room at one time. Um, what on loan means? Um, so on loan means that Senton has borrowed something from another institution or a private collector. So the chairs I mentioned are borrowed and the owner is the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. So we're very grateful um, to them for sharing a lot of their Logan collections with us. Um, this is a piece that the National Society of Colonial Dames owned. This um, high chest of drawers, so a single case but on um, a, a sort of table with cabriole legs, is probably from about, the seven, about 1750 and was Deborah Norris Logan's mother's marriage high chest. Um, her name was um, Mary Parker Norris. And I also wanted to make a point to show you um, a pair of stools we have in this room that um, also came down in the family, and I'm not sure if you can capture on this side, it's upside down as if um, Albanus Charles Logan, ACL, kind of took a chisel and sort of made sure everyone knew either that he was going to or he had inherited um, this pair of stools, which may have been part of four originally, and the other two, uh, the whereabouts are unknown. Um, one of the other really fun things in the room is this document box, um, not too long ago, given to Stenton by Logan descendants who live in England. Um, and the, the little label inside that's attached um, reads, Deeds and Papers for Sally Norris Dickinson. And it, it's a kind of curious arrangement in that um, it would seem it was made to be one height where the, and the lock was was moved up as they made the chest taller to accommodate a few more papers. And indeed, this um, person who donated the chest said his father had inherited quite a lot of papers as well. But you can see kind of the butterfly joints where the ch little chest was expanded. Yes, they did. So there was a question, did Deborah Norris Logan and John Fanny Watson stay friends after he published the annals? And I believe the answer is yes. She actually became, um, well, it was before the publication, but um, Watson and his, his kind of cronies who founded the Historical Society of Pennsylvania um, made her its first female member in 1827. So as we come around to the bedstead, I mentioned it's a it's a family um, one, and we really we think this is probably the bed that Deborah Norris Logan slept in. Um, we have also another loan that we have of the Thomas Tuft made furniture for Deborah is this little um, washstand with a space inside that would have been for the chamber pot, which we don't have one in there at the moment, and then the basin sits. 
in the top. Um, the looking glass is also from the same English descendant, and it has a partial label on the back for Elliott and Sons um, retailers in Philadelphia. So it's an English-made looking glass sold here in Philadelphia, ended up with Logan's back in England, and um, recently came to be in the Stenton collection as well. Um, and I also wanted to just take a moment with the, um, the fireplace in the room. The tiles in here, and we have some t um, posts on our website in the Curator's Cabinet of Curiosities you can find about various tiles in the house. But this room has plain white um, Delft or tin glaze earthenware tiles. And um, it tells us that this room was secondary to the yellow lodging room on the other side of the open doors where there are figural blue and white biblical tiles um, in that space. But the fireplace in here um, is, a, is a Franklin stove. Some of you viewing may know these forms, but Benjamin Franklin, in his desire to see fireplaces be more efficient, um, he really admired the, the German tradition, the Pennsylvania German tradition of the cast iron closed stoves that produced heat much more efficiently, but um, regretted that they didn't offer light as well. And so this is his idea of how to create a more radiant, closed, smaller chamber fireplace, but still offer light. And this was installed by George and Deborah Logan in the room that's below this, and kind of brought up into this space. So it's not actually truly fitted into the fireplace as it would have to be to be functional. Are the tiles original? Uh, we had a question about whether the tiles are original. These tiles are original to this space. But I also wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about the curtains in here. And I do also have a post on our, um, our blog slash um, Facebook page about these curtains. And these are reproductions made by the National Society of Colonial Dames in um, personally, Dames made these in the 1980s, copying surviving blue check curtains in our collection. And the surviving ones are a combination weave of linen and cotton. And George Logan was a, a proponent, um, you could say translate this in today to our like made in America and buy local. Um, he believed in home, homespun, homemade textiles. He wanted to see the new United States be less dependent on um, foreign made and particularly English made goods. And so um, we think the originals were probably woven nearby in Germantown where there were many weavers um, and then the curtains made. And it's just a really lovely and simple design, just a rectangle unlined, but on the reverse, it has an arc of tape to which are attached little tiny brass rings through which one's poured. And in, in the 1780s, you could not get polyester, just a note. Um, but this would, then when you draw the cord through the arcs, you create in reverse these arcs, these um, festoons as they were known, double in this case, two, two arcs of, um, of fabric. And so this is really one of the kind of fun survivals of our collection that we really, we do have some um, unusual and important 18th century furnishing textiles that have come down um, with the collection and in the family. So just another um, kind of very briefly to, to point out is um, the portrait in here is of George and, and Deborah's son, um, Algernon and Sidney Logan. So this is a mourning portrait and Deborah was a very sem sentimental person. So for her to kind of have um, kind of a constant reminder of a lost son with whom um, she was close and spent a lot of time was um, key to thinking about her personality. And she also um, created a family cemetery that's still out there, paved over in Stenton Park when George died in 1821. So these immediate generations are all actually buried um, here behind the house. So I don't know if there are any other questions. 
about the space or about Stenton sort of generally. But we're really grateful for your tuning in and the time to, um, to share with you, to share Stenton with you while um, we must still be closed. We haven't yet gotten the go ahead for when we can allow people back in the house. And so we'll continue to make programming available to you in various um, online and digital forms. So we're coming back next week at the same time to look at the Stenton entry. And we're following on from the spaces um, where our resident caretaker, Dawn Reed, who's a yoga teacher, is doing yoga. So she will be doing yoga in here in the Blue Watching Room on Monday. Um, so you can look for those notices as well. So thank you again for tuning in and um, we look forward to staying connected.